satellites all at one time. Uh, the total number of satellites is going up uh, quite, quite strong, and the percentage uh, of satellites that are, that are in, the, in the microsatellite category is, uh, is really gaining. If you look at just the difference between 2009 and 2013, from 15 up to 101 of these microsatellites. So some interesting trends uh, in, the, uh, in the, uh, uh, the business. I've got four really, really interesting uh, guests to talk to, to about uh, what's going on in the launch business and how that may affect uh, commercial space development. Uh, I think it's a, an interesting topic because uh, when you measure the industry in terms of revenues, which the Space Foundation does every year, uh, you find that the global revenue developed by the space industry uh, in 2012 was $304 billion American dollars. 70% of that was developed by commercial satellite companies and by the infrastructure associated with those companies and their applications. So it's a great topic for us to be discussing and uh, I'm gonna move over to my little chair here and uh, introduce our guests. I'll be asking them some questions and uh, ask for you to think of what questions you would like to ask them as well. There we go. So my first guest is Dr. Turkey. Uh, Dr. Turkey is uh, uh, in charge of the King Abdulaziz City for Science and Technology, and he has a portfolio of tremendously interesting uh, and challenging uh, uh, organizations that, that he is uh, overseeing, uh, including the Space Research Institute. Uh, Dr. Turkey, uh, I would like to ask uh, you know, your thoughts uh, on, uh, on your organization and, and your interest in, uh, in, uh, in the launch uh, capabilities. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I have to make a correction, otherwise I might be fired. I'm not in charge of the organization, I'm the vice president. I think the president will be <laughs> upset if, he, uh, if I endorse that. But um, uh, King Abdray City for Science Technology is the national uh, organization for the kingdom in science and technology and space is one of the technology uh, areas that the kingdom uh, is interested in. We started uh, activities in space since the 80s. We established the remote sensing center actually in around 83 and uh, we started receiving the imagery around 86 uh, with spot imagery and Landsat and then spot and now we receive lots of uh, imagery from uh, American, French, and other satellites as well. So the interest in the, ki in, in the kingdom uh, through King Abdurrahim City for Science Te Technology is long, and uh, uh, in the usefulness of, uh, you know, utilizing the usefulness of this uh, uh, technology. And uh, we have uh, been launching small satellites uh, in the last uh, decade. We've launched about 12 small satellites, uh, ranging from uh, 10 kilogram to 200 uh, kilogram. And uh, we have a launch this coming June, uh, a mission uh, joint with NASA uh, and Stanford doing a scientific experiment on our satellite. So um, certainly if you look at the graphs you just mentioned and the increase in the launch of uh, small satellites in the last few years. Uh, uh, 2013 is almost double 2012. And actually, you mentioned about 100, 2013, expected about 150 this year, and will actually be increasing and, and doubling within uh, four or five years. And the problem in your first graph that shows there will be less launches in the future because you're looking at the bigger satellites. Mm -hmm. And therefore, this gap is what we are interested in. We're very much interested in a, uh, launching for small satellites and uh, whether using uh, platforms such as the SHRP pl platform uh, uh, built by Spaceflight, which enable many small satellites to even go different uh, inclination than the orbit uh, that is used. Uh, this kind of uh, uh, launch system 
is very uh, interesting for us. And also uh, looking at uh, investment from the side of Tacni. I mean, I'm representing CACS, which is the national uh, science, but also a uh, technology organization, but also there is a national company for uh, commercialization of this technology in the kingdom, and I'm the chairman of this company, and it's called Tacnia, and it's interested in investment in uh, satellites and satellite services, and certainly in launch service. So we are interested to look at investments in uh, maybe launch vehicles that look at uh, small satellites. Uh, so this is an area of interest to us. Thank you very much. Uh, change to your program, Philip Slack could not make it. We have instead the erudite Thomas Carroll here with us. Tom is the regional director of uh, ILS, International Launch Services, and has been with ILS for 14 years. His territories include pretty much the known world as far as I can tell. Europe, the Middle East, Asia, Pacific, Africa, and Americas, and prior to ILS, he was director of sales for Orbcom. Tom? Thank you very much for inviting us. Again, I send apologies for uh, Mr. Slack. A uh, conflict came up on him Friday evening, and I was asked to come over here to uh, fill in for him. So thank you very much for inviting ILS. Uh, ILS is a uh, panel up here is commercialization of uh, the industry, the satellite industry. ILS's business is commercialization. Uh, the, uh, the formation of ILS was 20 years ago, 20 and a half years ago, that uh, Lockheed Martin and, I'm sorry, Lockheed Corporation at that time, I apologize <laughs> for them. Um, Lockheed, Energia, and Krinichev uh, formed a joint venture to bring Proton to the commercial marketplace. Uh, as the panels two earlier ago were talking about that, uh, what's going to happen 15 years ago from now. Uh, 20 years ago, this is, was a new changing thing to the industry, was bringing Proton to bring uh, commercial uh, services. Uh, since then, we've launched 85 commercial missions on Proton. Um, I'm going to say tomorrow, one of the big things for tomorrow, everybody, is uh, tomorrow is our anniversary of our first commercial launch uh, for Astra 1F. April uh, 8th, 1986. Got to go back to that year. So thank you very much. We're uh, very excited about commercial services. This is our current business and our future business. Thank you, Tom. Sitting next to Tom is a gentleman that has commercial launch in his title. Robert Cleave is president of commercial launch services for Lockheed Martin Space Systems Company and manages their commercial launch services company with a focus on operational execution. He's been doing that since 2012 began his career in 1987 as a satellite engineer. And so the conversations over lunch always get very interesting very fast. Robert? Thank you, and thank you for inviting me here today. I uh, really appreciate being uh, included on, on this panel. Um, let's see, the, the question was, was sort of how important is the launch business <laughs> to us? Um, so Space Systems Company, we make 100% of our revenues on space. Last year, it's this public uh, $10 billion of revenue generated. We participate in every segment of the value chain from building the payloads to the satellites to the, to the, uh, to the launch uh, with our partner, Boeing, on the United Launch Alliance. Uh, we also do uh, the tail end services, satellite operations and control, satellite management, fleet management, and so forth. And a saying that we've been using in our business is uh, pretty apropos, which is that without lift, there really is no space. It's a, Great to look at in the high bay, but until you have a launch vehicle to get you into the proper orbit, um, it doesn't do you a lot of good. It doesn't provide the kind of services that you want that satellite to provide. So we have, uh, um, with uh, uh, as a subcontractor to me, is United Launch Alliance. They've had, um, with the recent launch last week of uh, DMSP-19, that puts it to, um, I'll speak from a marketing perspective, and I'll speak from an engineering perspective. The marketing guy will tell you how many in a row that is, and, the engineer will always say each launch is one at a time, but that was 115 in a row, which is uh, best in class. Um, and it's the most reliable launch vehicle in the world today, as indicated by the insurance rates that we see out there. In fact, it's so reliable that in March, we were able to put together a program using the balance sheet of the corporation um, to, we call it a reflight or refund program, which guarantees that launch. It essentially gives you 100% your of your money back if that launch fails. There's no program like that in the business today. So that saves you money. Uh, we're trying to understand the buying behaviors of uh, our clients, and there are some discussions about that, and we can talk about that as well. Um, have a, um, 
a number of other launches this year. Commercially, we have a launch in August for the uh, Digital Globe customer, putting up Globe U3, uh, with a launch every year thereafter. We also have a, a smaller product, recognizing the desire to go to smaller satellites, kind of a Boyle's Wall concept, where you satellite fills the volume of the, the launch vehicle. If you can make it less expensive uh, by making it a smaller satellite, it's kind of constraining the mission. That's with our Athena program. That was the only program that was 100% privately financed. Uh, we took that out of commission in 2000. We're bringing it back in. It's a low and medium payload capability to principally low Earth orbit. Um, and so we're pretty excited about that program as well. Thank you. So Robert, since you introduced the subject of insurance premiums, let's introduce our final panelist, Philippe Monfer, who's managing director at Willis in Space based in Paris. He's uh, unique in the industry in that he's, uh, he's a broker, but he started as an engineer. So he does understand the systems literally from every bolt upwards. Uh, Philippe? If you say so. <laughs> Thank you very much for inviting uh, me to that panel. Um, just a few words about Willis. Willis uh, is an insurance, is a insurance broking firm based in London, and Willis in Space is a specialized department dealing only with uh, uh, space insurance matters. Um, Basically, what we do, our job starts when the uh, satellite is actually in the fairing of your rockets. Um, so what matters to us is not only the rocket itself, but the, the combination of the satellite and the rocket together. Uh, our customers are mainly the, the operators, the satellite operators. Uh, proud to say that uh, you know, I've personally uh, been involved in the uh, insurance of Raya D1, D2, D3, yes, at 1A and 1B in the region. So. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's a region I really like. And uh, suddenly, what strikes me, and maybe one of your charts didn't, didn't show that, but, or maybe I missed it, but uh, it's the, um, the share of the telecom satellites uh, in the overall number of satellites which are launched. Because our interest is only on, let's say, programs which bear a commercial share in some way. Otherwise, we don't insure. And um, in the past, we were only doing uh, Telecom satellites. Uh, it was relatively easy because there were only a few rockets. Now uh, there are a number of uh, satellites which uh, uh, actually provide different services, uh, you know, uh, up, uh, up earth observation, navigation, and so on and so forth. And also, there are plenty of rockets that you've shown that we are supposed to know uh, enough in order to be able to insure them. So I'm sure we've discussed more than that. Okay, thank you. Uh, we really would like to have questions from the audience as well. Um, so if you do have a question, even if we're going on up here, if you just kind of stand and, and get my attention, we'll be happy to, to take your questions as we go along. Um, Dr. Turkey, uh, when you hear the term space commercialization, uh, what types of space activities do, do you think of? And what can launch providers do to help make these activities possible? Well, I think uh, uh, certainly I look uh, mostly at low Earth orbit problem. In fact, the geostationary uh, satellites, the launch cost is, you know, l l certainly less than the cost of the, of the satellite, and therefore it is manageable. But uh, for low Earth orbit, uh, there is a lot of need, especially for small satellites, and uh, uh, the launch cost is very expensive. Uh, minimum cost is about $20,000 per uh, kilogram. That's the minimum cost. And for small satellites, it would be uh, prohibitive. And so I think of launch uh, uh, space commercialization, meaning enablement of uh, small satellites owners to participate in space and enhance space uh, exploration for developing nations and also uh, enhancing the development of science and technology through research. There is a lot of uh, research uh, going on in space. Many universities in the developed world and in the developing world who will benefit from access to space if the cost of launch is reduced. And that's my main concern. Thank you. Uh, 
Robert, Dr. Turk has cut right to the heart of the matter, so the next question is, is for you. Uh, it seems, and it's been forever that we've heard this, that ever lower launch costs are the holy grail of our industry. And I know at lunchtime we had a hypothetical, what if, if launch cost zero, what would things look like? Um, just how elastic is the market and, and what are the barriers to getting that launch cost down? Uh, it's, it's a good question. I always try to ponder this question. That's why I ask you to lunch so I could have some answers in case I'm on a panel that afternoon and somebody asks me the question. <laughs> um, the, uh, uh, it, you know, it's interesting. There have been some good studies out there about the elasticity or the inelasticity of launch. Um, you know, I know when Proton was first introduced, I think the prices were in the 40s and the market demand didn't go up by a factor of two. Um, and of course, I'd like to hear your thoughts about that as well. Um, the um, the, the, the difficulty of building a satellite is, is the payload. That's always been the long pole. Um, for example, on a communication satellite uh, at KA Van Tubes, it takes about 18 months to get the tubes. If one would order them today, 18 months later they would come. And so would somebody be willing to buy a volume of tubes and put in inventory? That, that would help. Um, there is a program in the U.S. called the Hosted Payload uh, Procurement Hops. And uh, there's been a lot of discussion about how do we make it so we make these launches more regular, get these set programs out there, these hosted payloads out there. And the general consensus is there needs to be an investment into the payload. I do believe that if the launch costs come down, and I do agree with, with uh, what was said about the need to get the low Earth orbit costs down, I think they are too high right now. I do believe that if they come down substantially enough that we'll see a greater uh, increase in the, um, the use of space for for all kinds of purposes, the purposes that we go to space, for the perspective that it provides, or and two other reasons that we don't use today, which is the microgravity or the vacuum properties. We really don't exploit space for those two properties, really the, only the perspective, which gives you remote sensing satellites or your communication satellites. But um, I do believe that it's got some elasticity to it. I'd be, I'd be hesitant to guess. I don't know, but you were there in the early days of ILS. I mean, what were your thoughts about elasticity? <laughs> Um, the elasticity is not driven by price. It's uh, more of the market demand and what the uh, orbital slots and the, the uh, real business case of the satellite uh, operator that's putting the satellite up. Uh, did lower prices for launch uh, drive it? Sure. Uh, back then, the uh, cost of a launch price was maybe 20% of, of the total project. Mm -hmm. So if you went from 20% to 18% to 17%, of an overall project. We still had very expensive satellites. Um, the insurance industry now is so much better priced. Um, there was years ago when uh, I was launching satellites for, as a satellite operator, we had a cu cutoff of 23%. At 23%, we would do our own self-funding. Now the rates are below 10%, I believe, for launch insurance, uh, roughly. So there's a number of parameters to the overall. Launch is just one portion of it satellites portion of it. So it's a matter of what all those percentages together. So Philippe, it sounds like uh, Robert is very pleased with the insurance industry. Um, if you could help us out here, uh, one of the things that always uh, befuddles me is, is when you have a new product on the market, how do you figure out what it's going to cost to insure that? And so as we look at new launchers coming on, you know, Falcon 9, Antares, and so forth, how do, you, how do you get to the calculus that tells you what the risks involved really are and how do you persuade an underwriter to set a rate and, and be able to communicate that rate to the customer successfully? Well, it's, uh, that's a proprietary recipe that I'm not going to give now. <laughs> uh, no, of course, no, there is no recipe. It's, 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 a, it's a difficult uh, question because um, yeah, we are confronted with new rockets. Um, I mean, recently we had, you know, Atlas V, uh, SpaceX, H2A, and, and, and also some other ones, smaller ones. And each time, indeed, the question is how do you price it in terms of risks, of course. I mean. And the only way uh, to do that is uh, to get technical information on, on the rocket itself, but also on the quality control. Because I think that it's not only good to have a perfectly uh, a built rocket, designed built rocket, but it's also very important the way you operate it, the way the quality control is managed and, and verified. And unfortunately, the only way to prove that is by launching, right? So when you have a new rocket, it's pretty difficult. So what the market does is, uh, 
and it's maybe not the right way to do it, I'm just telling you what it does, is that they detect the, um, what they find as equivalent uh, vehicles on the market, and they say, okay, you know, I charge a little bit more because it's new, but I can't also, I cannot really put the uh, burden on it saying, you know, because it's, it's, it's new, I multiply the rate by three. That wouldn't be fair either. So basically, you, what you see is, uh, is a, you start from a certain setting, and then depending on the, uh, on the success or failures of the very few launches, the very first uh, launches, then suddenly either the, the curve drops dramatically or it will remain at a certain level. So basically, um, you can only judge uh, of the uh, insurance rate of a new rocket after, say, I don't know, three, five uh, uh, launches, because then you know what you're talking about. Before, yes, we've got to give our customers a certain indication, and again, the, by, by similarity, um, and also there is a factor which is totally independent from, from that, is the, on our market, we look for a certain amount to be insured. So say you're looking for $250 million, for instance, um, because that's the book value uh, which is uh, 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 secured by our customers. So basically, uh, we have to find enough capacity in the market for that. Now, for a new rocket, that's going to be the problem because the insurers will say, okay, I'm, I'm ready to risk my money on a new rocket, but not as much as I would do on, on a stabilized, well-known rocket. So instead of, uh, you know, uh, risking 10 millions, each of them, they will risk 5 million. So therefore, at the end of the day, I'm missing some... Uh, valuable dollars to insure my customer, and therefore to find these dollars will have to pay more. So that's a sort of a circle, and at the end of the day, if you look at the statistics, yes, of course, by definition, the new rockets pay more, but that could go, that could come back to the uh, uh, average uh, premium rate very, very quickly if they behave uh, nicely. So. Thank you. Uh, question to both uh, Robert and Thomas, uh, since you're the two up here that have rockets in your pockets. Um, thinking of commercialization, uh, I'm, I'm tempted to think about some of the new products and new programs and efforts that are out there. The uh, Google Lunar X Prize has been mentioned several times today. I'm also uh, uh, very conscious of the efforts that Bob Bigelow has going on out in the desert with his, uh, with his uh, he hates when you call them inflatable, expandable habitation modules. Um, when you look at some of these things like Destination Mars and, and Dream Chaser and so forth, um, what, are the, what are the new efforts that are out there that are interesting to you because of the vehicles that you have in your stable? And what would you like to see flying on your, on your vehicles in the next few years that maybe you've never done before? Um, well, I'm ready for that. Well, we've, uh, all of those projects, of course, are very interesting. They're difficult for us to uh, help some of those programs. They come talking to us, asking us, because we provide commercial launch services to specific operators. So we fly each mission is unique and optimized to give the maximum lifetime for each of those satellites. So it's difficult for us to put a secondary payload or something like that on the satellite, unless that satellite operator agrees to uh, lower capability or le lower performance of the rocket. What we're more excited about is the uh, more of the hybrid satellites and the all-electric satellites because Proton is one of the few launch vehicles in the world that can do direct injection into GSO. The Breeze M uh, separates all payloads at, um, at Apogee, not Epic of Perigee, uh, for those that are in here in chat testing. So, when we launch, we actually can launch a satellite up to about 3,500 kilos directly into GSO orbit. Uh, there's no uh, orbit raising, nothing. Uh, it's merely just drifting into it. We've launched, I believe, five satellites like that for SES, Intelsat, and one other customer. For right now, with the exact other customer. So more of the electric propulsion, I'd like to see. Uh, the other that also allows us with some of those hybrids is dual launch. We've been launching uh, more two launch satellites on it. That's cutting the cost to satellite operators in half. Uh, we just charge for the, the amount of the proton that they're using and try to split it 50-50 between the two of them and launch us two satellites in at the same time. So we're trying to drive costs down. So those two things, we're really looking for more electric propulsion and hybrid satellites coming. Robert? Um, we like anything that needs a lift. 
<laughs> so uh, that's essentially what we're in. We're in the, the, the transportation business. Um, and so uh, similarly, the, the Atlas V, the Centaur for Stage, has the ability to do a direct insertion, which uh, it, it can do. That's actually how Mill Stars used to be launched, to direct an insert into the orbit, so it's nothing really new there. Um, laws of physics are hard to change. Uh, stat configurations, electric, the things we mentioned uh, just now, certainly will help drive the demand up, we think, because it's going to make the, the business cases more attractive. For, for Goddard, uh, we launched last year, uh, sorry, 2012, uh, a stack satellites on top of each other, and this fall, I believe it's going to slip, but there's a mission for Goddard that's four satellites all stacked on top of each other, so that's four satellites simultaneously launched. So the, out the launch vehicle doesn't really care what's in it as long as it can survive the loads. It doesn't really care what's in it. We look at hosted payloads, uh, you know, whether they're small sats. Uh, we've been approached by companies wanting to put ashes in orbit, probably a 202. Uh, we haven't really, not sure what to do about that one yet. Um, and then uh, in the low Earth orbit, we are excited about these emerging constellations, whether they're Planet Labs or Planet Q or Skybox or others that are to be announced here shortly, uh, putting up constellations of small, or small satellites moving in a kind of a swarm mentality and maybe taking the technologies that have developed for driverless cars and applying that for spacecraft. We think that's, there's a lot of, lot of potential there. And one of the benefits that I have is I can see a lot of the, the funnel of technology being developed within the corporation that allows me to, to figure out how I, where I need to position our services to best add value. Thank you. So Dr. Turkey, the two gentlemen have just uh, been telling us about their rockets have some very, very large uh, and heavy lift capabilities. And what you were saying is that you need the ability to launch small satellites. And uh, over lunch, we were talking with one of the gentlemen from Surrey Satellite, and, and he, was, uh, he was also uh, talking about how difficult it can be uh, to get a ride for small satellites. So uh, considering this whole range of satellites that we have, do you feel that our current launch capacity is adequate to meet the needs of organizations like yours? And what are, what are your top concerns about being able to have the access that you need to space? <clears throat> I don't think the, the current capacity is adequate. And actually there are efforts, even by Lockheed was not mentioned, that uh, using airborne uh, uh, assisted launch vehicles, and there is activities by many companies, and that, that uh, gives hope. To, uh, to launch satellite, small satellites uh, using these systems and, and that could drive the cost uh, down. There is um, also uh, new technologies like hybrid uh, rocket uh, technology, hybrid propulsion, which reduce the cost considerably. And there are lots of activities and NASA as well as DARPA and they're all funding these kinds of activities and I think uh, looking at a vehicle, uh, ideally you want to look at a vehicle that will launch a satellite between 50 to 300 kilograms. And there is no launcher now existing that has that kind of uh, uh, mission, and, but at low cost. In fact, the larger the vehicle, the, lo the lower the cost per <laughs> kilogram, and, and, uh, but using different technologies such as airborne or uh, hybrid rockets, I think that gives hope for lower cost but the one I mentioned earlier, which is even for heavy uh, vehicles, using uh, a space tug like uh, Sherpa, uh, which is, you know, could be one of the, you know, uh, hybrid satellites that you put, it's like a big satellite, you put a low Earth orbit, but that one will carry many satellites into it. And it has a propulsion system, it has a power system, and that kind of concept may reduce, utilize, the lower cost of larger vehicle per kilogram, and this may actually be the solution. Another very great hope is the use of a space station. There are uh, uh, companies now like NanoRacks, which we actually work with them, uh, who have access to a space station, and they only toss the, you know, they just throw the small satellite out, and they are looking up to 50 kilogram. So there is, great opportunities that, uh, that we think are coming in the future. The, uh, the, the NanoRacks uh, capability is, is pretty neat. I was uh, in Houston a couple weeks ago walking through the trainer, 
And uh, for those of you who haven't seen it, it's, it's kind of like a, a potato gun or something. I mean, you just load all these satellites in it and poke it out the door and poop, 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 it just kind of spits them out. So, uh, so interesting, interesting uh, capability there. Elliot, before you go, hmm? Russia is developing the new Angora rocket. And uh, 1.2, Angora 1.2 is at the pad now doing its uh, dry, uh, dry testing at the launch pad in process. So the new Angra series of rockets will be a modular rocket. Still won't meet your target for that small of a satellite, but a cluster. It'll be replacing a lot of the Russian rockets you were showing earlier are going to go are going to be phased out, and that'll be the Angra for the future. And we'll have those, some of those capabilities for clusters. So great. That's coming. Great. Well, since you brought up this topic of the Russians, we'll come back to the Russians in a minute. Okay. Um, you know. Uh, I guess a question for Philippe is uh, uh, when you see these, these new uh, uh, launch, launches being made where you have four, five, 20 different smaller satellites all bunched up on one launch vehicle, and it seems like each of these carries a different number of satellites and each of them has a different, it's, it's, there's, there doesn't seem to be a standardization. So how do you, how do you assess the risk on a, on a launch of multiple uh, satellites from a single vehicle? Actually, um, the way we do that is uh, there are two separate independent risks. The first one is the boost phase of the rocket where the, you know, there is the fairing or it's un encapsulated and that is what counts for us is the reliability figure of the rocket itself. Then once you have separation, uh, then indeed what is important is what happens with the satellites. And if it's a big telecom satellite that we know, then we'll deploy the solar arrays, the antennas, and so on and so forth. We have enough experience uh, in order to, you know, uh, make a quote on that and say, okay, that's going to cost in, the, in today's market so much. Now, of course, we've been exposed to nano satellites uh, recently. Uh, last year, we showed actually 21 nano satellites on, on the Dnieper. Um, <coughs> that was the first time, uh, but basically when you look at these cubes, uh, they have no propulsion, they have no means of uh, being controlled in one way or another. So, of course it's new, uh, and there are many of them, but each of them is extremely simple. So there are very little possibilities for them to fail, or, or if they fail, it's, it's a total failure. So in the telecom satellites, in the big satellites, we, we have to define some partial failure modes. Uh, which can become com complex in our world, you know, when we have cable and spot beam and these kind of things, it becomes complex. But on these small satellites, again, even if there are 20 or 30 or 50 of them, then you can think about the collisions, and that's, a, that's, a that's an insurance contract as well, but it's a different one. It's for the third party legal liability. And then, in, indeed, when you launch that many satellites, you can have um, impacts or you can have debris, and you can, it, they can become debris, actually, if they are not uh, controlled. And, uh, but if we look at the uh, <coughs> traditional uh, space insurance contract, which is a damage insurance, I would say it's relatively easy, actually, on these satellites. Um, what, uh, what actually uh, causes a problem uh, to uh, um, identify the level of the risk is when the new technology comes in and that um, we are restricted to get information because either it's uh, ITER or because it's coming from the military side, and so we are given access, but up to a certain level of details, and that, that is more difficult. But, you know, my experience is that we always find a way, so. Thank you. Uh, again, Thomas and, and, and Robert, uh, since the subject of, of Russian launch vehicles came up, uh, I think uh, probably a question on the minds of many is given the current tensions between uh, Russia and the United States, and without getting too overtly political here, but. You know, what assurances would each of you give your customers about the continued availability of your vehicles? Uh, well, mine is, mine is a 100% Russian rocket vehicle, so it's going to be, it's built 100% in Russia, it's a Russian rocket, so U.S. government is not going to be changing the configuration of a Russian-built rocket. Um, the question more opposed to us is more of licensing. And we have licenses are all in place for U.S. State Department and DOD for providing launch services to our customers. 
Uh, we don't provide hardware or any exporting of services, so it's really just a launch service. We export off the planet, launching it from Baikonur Cosmodrome to Kazakhstan. So uh, we have licenses in place, and we're launching our satellites this year, just as planned. So we don't project any uh, difficulty. Now, we can't predict all politics, of course, but right. we don't have any difficulties right now based on all the, uh, I'll say, memos. It's mostly just memos in, in Washington right now. Uh, we're fine for launching all our satellites this year. Great. Robert? So, uh, similarly, we, uh, of course, rely on the RD-180 engine. Um, two presidents uh, advocated that we do this. Uh, it's th this morning we heard almost every panelist up there speak about globalization and the need to find partners and the need to work things out uh, with, with other countries and to, in order to bring best value to consumers. And best value means choice. Um, so in prior administrations, they were, they, they, and this is before my time, you were probably around there, Thomas, but it was, it was uh, we were advocated to use an RD-180 engine. Um, it was codified in policy. The co policy was amended and reinforced in 2004 and 2008. Um, right now, we've gotten no indications that there are any issues with, uh, with the inventory. We do have sufficient inventory to satisfy all of our launch needs, so uh, we've told our clients not to be concerned at this point. Um, but the, the amount of Russian propulsion technology that's throughout the worldwide aerospace industry is pervasive. I mean, all those launch vehicles you saw earlier, um, and you look at all the communication satellites that are being put up, they often them hold uh, communication services for government users. Um, there's a huge reliance on that technology. It's, it's embedded, and it's also on not just the launch vehicles, but it's also this technology on satellites, too, uh, which is well known. The SBTs are well known to be Russian built on the Loral satellites. And so um, this is something that we see is it's, it's very high technology. It's hard to replace. There's not an easy substitute for it. Um, and I think uh, the policy will evolve. I'm not here to really cr criticize the policy. I'm not going to comment it one way or the other except that we have no issues right now with respect to our current manifest and the loss of the capability that, that exists. It's the world's most reliable engine. Why, why not use it? Great. I will buy one from each of you. Um, Dr. Turkey, I was, uh, this is my first trip to Abu Dhabi. And uh, so I was looking on the map to see exactly where I was going. And I couldn't help notice that uh, we're actually sitting here just slightly closer to the equator than Kennedy Space Center. Uh, so do you think we will be seeing space launch operations from this location someday? And what might that look like? Well, I think it's certainly possible. Um, the, the launch of, uh, you know, fixed sites like, you know, big rockets is, is um, limited because of the aerospace and, and uh, there are lots of activities that really limit the site. And I think in this area is very limited. It's not easy to do. But I think the air, airborne assisted, airborne assisted launch can be very uh, possible to see uh, in the future from this region. We'll look forward to it. We're, uh, we're running down on time here. I have one more uh, question for uh, Philippe, since we're talking about spaceports, and if this is not in your, in your area, feel free to punt it back. Um, one of the things we're seeing is many locations now competing to become commercial spaceports, and we have a, a, and, uh, the, uh, the Office of, of Commercial Space Transportation and the FAA is issuing permits and so forth. It seems like one of the, the common uh, requests when people are, are organizing a spaceport is to, to, is to look for the, for the local government or the regional government to indemnify the operations there. Um, how important is that, or is that a smokescreen? And is that something that, that uh, you've looked at as an issue? Is this an entire issue of indemnifying startup type operations at new spaceports? Well, <laughs> uh, the short answer is I don't know. Um, now, I can tell you that uh, in terms of um, coverage for the liability of, uh, of a spaceport operation, uh, that's something which is available, I mean, very easily. There is no particular uh, 
thing to do to get it uh, you know, on, on the open commercial insurance market. Um, now, th that being said, you know, um, uh, this is, I think, uh, a really US centered issue. I don't see that really elsewhere in the world. So uh, I guess that's, <laughs> once I've said that, I guess it's more political than uh, anything <laughs> else. <laughs> is that a product of how many lawyers we have instead of engineers? Sorry? Is it a product of the fact that we have so many lawyers and so few engineers in the United States? <laughs> no comment. Okay. Well, listen, uh, this has been just wonderful. Let's take a couple of questions. Yes, right here in the front row. Stefan. Stefan? Coming behind you. Stefan Chenard, you're a consult. I have a couple of questions for uh, Dr. Turkey. Um, we have suddenly seen a succession of increasingly sophisticated satellites uh, being launched by CAXT. I think uh, we would all be interested to know what, the, what your next steps are in this program, um, what, your, what your launch plans look like. And second, I think quite a few people are going to leave this room with the strong impression that CAXT, either as a space agency or as an investor, since you mentioned you have an investment fund um, at your... Um, at your disposal, uh, will uh, that you have a, an air launch uh, uh, vehicle project? Is that the fair statement, or are we connecting dots too quickly? The last uh, part, I did not hear it well. The last part. He was asking, do you have a project for airlift? Oh, airlift launch. Is no, I, I actually am speaking about uh, the whole. I don't talk about only Saudi Arabia. I'm talking about the whole uh, region. The question was. Uh, Last question was about the whole region. Um, I, uh, uh, as far as the satellites, yes, the kingdom, uh, you know, we've launched 12 satellites, as I mentioned, and we're, uh, in, we have a very uh, aggressive program, uh, both for uh, remote sensing, geostationary, also we're building a geostationary satellite, and uh, uh, we have scientific satellites. Uh, we have a agreed with NASA and DLR that will use our Saudi Sat 4, which is a 100 kilogram satellite, to launch uh, many missions in the future. Every two years we'll probably be launching a satellite, uh, testing some sort of uh, an experiment uh, related to space science. So yes, we have an aggressive, almost 10 year uh, program with many scientific and commercial applications. And there, there is uh, also the commercial arm of CAXT, which is Tacnia, uh, is commercializing this technology um, and, and building satellites for commercial purposes. Uh, so that's what we, uh, but, uh, and Tacnia is interested in the investment, uh, in certainly in launch uh, capabilities, investing in some of the programs that are innovative, including air launch and including, um, hybrids and things, but this is an investment outside the kingdom. Activities outside the kingdom. We, we are at the end of our time, but I would like to offer one more question if we, if we have anybody that's got a burning question. If not, I'd like to thank the panel. It's been uh, great to be here with you and, and to, to hear from you on this, on this topic. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you.